Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second session of our meeting today on glacial isostatic adjustment. Uh, the, I will be moderating the second session. My name is Jessica Warren. I'm at the University of Delaware and a member of COSEG. Uh, the session is going to be led off by Harriet Lau of Brown University, and the title of her talk is Understanding the Role of Interacting Timescales of Deformation. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I'm going to share screen now. This, this looks good. All right. Let me make this panel small. Great. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, COSEG, for inviting me to speak. And also, I hope everyone had a really good break um, and ready for some uh, another round of talks. And so today, um, I'll be talking about why it's important to understand how Earth deforms um, differently to ice changes on variables timescales. And what are those timescales, you might ask? Um, actually, all the timescales you could possibly imagine. And so I'm going to start, ooh, here we go, with a graph of or a plot of what sea, the rate of sea level changes today due to changes in ice that happened thousands of years ago. And so what you're seeing um, in blue are places where sea level is rising today and in red where sea level is falling. And again, this has nothing to do with modern sea level change. This is sea level change we're locked into because two ginormous ice sheets, the Laurentide um, shown here, I don't know if you can see my mouse. I can't see my mouse. Mm -hmm. But the Laurentide, which covered most of North America, and the Fenoscandian ice sheet. And again, those ice sheets vanished about 7,000 years ago. And yet today, we are still seeing the effects of their, um, of their demise. And so if we kind of look at DC, where we are, many of us are here today, you can see we're facing sea level rise at pretty rapid rates. Um, and this is because basically the mantle has delayed the subsidence of the crust. And so anthropogenically driven climate change today is really an overprint of climate change driven on the thousands of years time scales to the millions of years time scales. And so we can actually see the record of these interacting time scales in paleoclimate records. And so this, what I'm showing you are variations in oxygen isotopes as measured in marine sediment cores. And basically this gives you an idea of how global ice volume has changed in the past. And so this is that record about 25,000 years ago, the peak is the last ice age. And so that was about 25,000 years ago. And you see it decreased to today. And so 25,000 years ago, as I mentioned, we were covered by the Laurentide ice sheet and the Finiscandian ice sheet. But if we kind of zoom out and go back in time, that last glacial maximum was preceded by times that were actually kind of like today, the last interglacial, about 120,000 years ago. And if we zoom further back in time, we actually see that climate flipped in and out of ice ages, paced at around 100,000 years for the last million years, and going even further back in time, about two and a half million years ago. What you see is that when the Northern Hemisphere ice sheets kind of nucleated, um, ice ages happened at a completely different timescale, 40,000 years ago, um, 40,000 year timescales until mi mysteriously flipping to this 100,000 year timescales. And really, this is just to emphasize that every single time we grow an ice sheet or shrink an ice sheet, no matter how fast or slow we do this, GIA is induced. And so going back to this picture of today, on top of this record, on top of what we're inheriting from the past, we have to understand and disentangle the signatures ongoing today. And so melting today is happening at tens of years, hundreds of years. And if we look at here, this is a picture of the now long gone Larsen B ice shelf, the size of my new home state, Rhode Island. Thankfully, it's not Texas or something like this. Um, Rhode Island is the smallest state in the union. What we want to understand is how we disentangle all these different signals of defamation to then understand how we move forward into the future. 
And one way to do this is to actually look at other geophysical phenomena. So, you know, ice, moving ice deforms the earth, but actually other processes also produce deformation. And so on the kind of short time scales on the left of this figure, if an earthquake strikes, seismic waves ripple through the planet. And these seismic waves, as they ripple, they're causing small amounts of deformation within the Earth's interior. And these are kind of at seconds to subseconds kind of time scales. If you wait long enough, these waves can interfere and constructively interfere and kind of produce these whole Earth vibrations that you're seeing here, we call normal modes. And these happen on minutes to hours. If we go kind of longer, um, Grace Neal talked about this in the in the first session, post seismic relaxation, how the earth recovers after an ice sheet, hours to days to even years afterwards, we can use to understand earth's deformation. And if we keep moving to longer timescales, we hit glacial isostatic adjustment in response to the last ice age. But even further back, we can hit um, timescales of plate tectonics. So the millions, tens of millions of years, hundreds of millions of years timescales, where actually earth flows. And so from short time scales to long time scales, what we do know is that at the short time scale, Earth really behaves nearly elastically. But moving towards these long time scales, Earth behaves like a viscous fluid. And so kind of observing all these different processes and kind of and combining insights from experimental data, can we build a general model of deformation that accounts for all these time scales of deformation? Because Ultimately, if we want to kind of understand how we move forward in terms of ice melt today, we need some level of generality. And so there is an established model that we've talked about already in the first um, session, and this is what we call the Maxwell model. And the Maxwell model can describe those two N members of um, deformation. And so this is what the Maxwell model looks like. It's comprised of an elastic spring and a viscous dash pot in series. And so you can imagine if you applied a stress to this contraption, a really fast stress, the elastic spring will deform. And so just imagine the earth deforming like an elastic solid. This is what geophysicists do to model GIA. If we start slowing that stress down, the viscous dash pot will take up more of that deformation. And the transition between these two end member models can be anything between hundreds to thousands of years uh, within the Earth's mantle. And that really depends on where you are in the mantle, how hot the mantle is. And so what this is basically what most GIA modelers use. There is a growing consensus, though, um, coming from the rock physics community, that actually the Maxwell model, which I just showed you, isn't quite enough to really explain the full spectrum of deformation that the Earth undergoes. And so what rock physicists do is they actually um, basically crush rocks, deform rocks, and watch what they do. And so typically, you will take a, a, a natural sample at times. So this is um, shown here on my shelf. This is a sample of the San Carlos Peridot. And the green um, crystals you see are really large olivine crystals. And that's basically the major mineral that's made, that makes up most of the uppermost mantle. There's a little um, soccer player, Manchester United soccer player here shown for scale. And so what, what rock physicists do is they'll take natural samples and put them inside these kinds of contraptions. And I'm sorry, my mouse doesn't work, but I hope that my explanation is enough to show you where I'm going. Some experimentalists actually use synthetic materials where they kind of fabricate rock-like um, rock materials. But ultimately, what you do is you take your sample and confine it at high pressures and temperatures to kind of emulate mantle. And you'll apply stresses of different timescales and basically see what happens with how the sample responds. And really what rock physicists want to do is investigate the grain and the subgrain interactions um, that fundamentally control macroscopic deformation. And so with all this kind of knowledge, you can build a mechanistic model at the grain scale of what drives and what dictates deformation. And so um, this is one example from a lab. Um, this is the ANU lab. Um, 
what you see is that short time skills to long time skills, different types of mechanism of defamation are activated. And so um, at the short time scale in this model, what you get is a process called elastically accommodating, accommodated sliding. So viscous sliding of these grain boundaries leads to elastic stress concentrations at the corners. And if you move to longer time scales, those stress concentrations cause diffusion away from those corners. And actually these two first two phases basically produce at the macro scale, time dependent defamation, but it's fully recoverable. Now, if you keep moving to longer time scales, you get to that kind of flow I talked about, those mental convection time scales. And this is basically what we call diffusion creep. But the important thing here is that the defamation characterized is completely permanent. And ultimately, the Maxwell model can't explain these two first processes. And so there is a search to augment this contraption with some sort of transient component in the middle. And there have been many proposed kind of options, but really our picture of these kinds of contraptions, I've shown you only one example from one lab, Really what's happening at this kind of micro scale level, we, the description is far from complete. And so we really need to do more experiments. These experiments are very hard to do. You're measuring very tiny amounts of strain at frequencies that are very hard to activate. And so there have been proposals. And so the ideal format of what a viscoelastic model or viscoelastic law might look like is if you know the environment that a rock exists in and some of its fundamental properties, what I've called here the state variables, so this could be the temperature, the pressure of the rock is, the grain size, the composition of the rock. If you have a full description, this viscoelastic law or viscoelastic model, you should be able to predict the deformational properties of that rock at any given time scale. And so this is the ultimate goal that many rock physicists work towards. And so what we try to do is use an example on the macro scale and see what these experimental laws can predict. And so we looked at the case of uh, Greenland. This is a, a study led by Guy Paxman. And what I'm showing you here, firstly, is Greenland and uh, GPS um, rates of uplift. But on the right figure, what I'm showing you are viscosity estimates of the subsurface of Greenland made from very different types of observations. And so the first on the left is GIA based on data from the Little Ice Age, so that was about 200 years ago. And then the next is from the last glacial maximum, so about 25,000 years ago. And then on the far right, this is from um, data based on mantle convection. And so this again is kind of tens to hundreds of millions of years. And as you can see, they don't really match. There is a sort of multiple orders of magnitude range, but as you've already gathered from this talk, if you order these processes in time scale, you can see some trend, right? And so GIA from Little Ice Age is kind of low. And if you move to the longer time scale of mantle convection, these viscosity estimates increase. And so this is precisely what those experimental results predict. This is exactly what their laws would say. And so we thought we'd try to implement some of their laws to see what they would say about Greenland. And so what we did was we first took constraints from Greenland subsurface structure based on seismology. And so again, remember seismology is kind of on the second time scale. And this on the left is that seismic tomographic map we used. And so really, um, variations in seismic wave speed here, Vs, uh, basically give you an indication of how material properties vary on short seismic timescales. And with that kind of viscoelastic law from the experiments, we want to predict how that kind of deformational properties of the Earth vary at much longer timescales. And to get to this point, as I showed you in that flow, we have to first retrieve those intrinsic properties of rock that are ultimately independent of time scale, right? So that temperature, the composition. And so if I bring back that kind of flow of what a viscoelastic law does, this is it here again. And so the first step was to use that kind of seismically defined um, constrained structure. 
and actually do the reverse. And so we use the Bayesian method to do this, but ultimately we use those material properties constrained at seismic time scales. And this in that viscoelastic law would actually be an output of that law. And we did the inverse process to retrieve those state variables using the same law. And so what we get are the state variables, right? The temperature, the pressure, the estimates of the grain size. And once you have those inputs, you can then use the same law to then predict structure at other time scales. And so to do this self consistently, and again, this is the, the goal of what rock physicists try to do, is to get a viscoelastic law able to explain deformation on a kind of the full spectrum of geophysical processes. And so this is that estimate, one kind of one output of the kind of model um, of the Bayesian inversion that we did of those intrinsic properties. And so temperature on the left, as you can see, much of Greenland sits above um, anomalously cold mantle. So this is about 200 kilometers depth. And as you move towards Iceland, you can see the influence of the Iceland plume heating up the ambient mantle. And this pattern is sort of reflected in our estimates of melt fraction and grain size. And again, all of these have uncertainties. This is just one such posterior model. And so with these intrinsic properties, we can then predict behavior of Greenland, um, the kind of deformational behavior on a wide time scale. And so these are predictions of the effect of viscosity at different time scales using those intrinsic properties. And here these are used with the experimental model of Take and Yamauchi. And so what you see here on the kind of decadal to centennial time scales at the top, on the top row, um, the satellite era, the Little Ice Age era, you see low viscosities in general. But if you move towards longer time scales, viscosity starts to increase by an order of magnitude. And again, this is exactly what we saw in those data. There are many reasons why we had conflicting estimates of viscosity, but this certainly could play a role. And so that's basically, this is basically in, in me trying to say that these time scales are very important in understanding the response of GIA, because ultimately what you're getting is order of magnitudes variation in viscosity, which really dictates the flow of the mantle. But interacting timescales of GIA also interacts with other systems that also have their own timescales. And so this is sort of a, an aside to basically demonstrate two examples that are kind of adjacent to GIA, but fundamental to ice change. And so um, there's also the cryosphere and the sea level and, and the sea level change that we're going to discuss briefly. But ultimately, um, ice elevation is completely controlled, well, very much controlled by GIA. And so here I'm showing you a schematic of a, a, a growing ice sheet. As precipitation falls, depending on the altitude, that precipitation can land as snow and be packed and you grow an ice sheet. If you're below this altitude, precipitation falls as rain and you're in the ablation zone. And so this altitude is kind of known as the ice equilibrium line. And so you can start seeing if we grow an ice sheet, the weight of the ice sheet causes the crust to subside. It causes GIA. Until that ice sheet reaches glacial ice, some glacial maximum. Now, if climate changes to a melt phase, the ice sheet will respond much more quickly than the solid earth. And so what you actually get is a shrinking ice sheet. Now the problem is viscous stresses in the mantle delay rebound and keeps the ice sheet at low altitudes and low altitudes basically enhance melt because you are below that equilibrium line. You are in the ablation zone and there is this delay. And so understanding how much delay happens is extremely important in understanding ice dynamics also. And so this is the situation in North America today. Much of Canada is rebounding still, even though the ice sheet is completely, um, is completely gone. Now, the other related process is that of, of sea level. Um, if you keep the ice sheet low, and if you keep it low below sea level, and the ice sheet is connected to the ocean, you will get inundating warm ocean waters that actually 
enhance ice melt quite drastically and processes like carving can happen and you erode an ice sheet extremely quickly. Now this is exacerbated basically if we have delayed rebound from GIA, which is exactly what happens. And so these two processes um, coincide and coexist with these interacting time scales of GIA. And this marine inundation was actually thought to be quite important in the demise of the Fenniscandian and Laurentide ice sheet, which had marine based sectors at their kind of peak. And this today is a possible scenario for Western Antarctica because, as we know, it is a marine based ice sheet. And so I just want to add these two other systems, the cryosphere and sea level, into the story of GIA. But ultimately, um, just to summarize, we are facing orders of magnitudes of change when we look at a single measurement of GIA anywhere, really. And so really what we have to understand is the many time skills deformation that Earth has inherited today to enable us to disentangle that signal from the additional melt that's happening at much more rapid paces and actually accelerating paces, right? And until we do that, we can't really say what the future holds. And so as a community, I guess the take home messages from my um, talk is that, you know, GAA modelers, firstly, we have to understand how rocks deform on multiple timescales. And this can be done in many ways. We can use macroscopic kind of planetary scale observations of, of how the Earth's deforming. Many of the first talks discuss this and discuss how we can measure and observe this, but we also could combine this with kind of microphysical insights from the laboratory. And together, finally, we have to be able to implement these modeling um, insights into our models, sorry, so we can account for this deformation. Um, and I think that's the end of my talk, so thank you. Thank you very much, Harriet, for a really great talk. Um, do we have any questions from the committee? Rengen? Thanks very much. Very informative. But I, I have a question about your lab experiment. Um, the scale you showed us, you had the short-term, transient, and then long-term. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like it can be uh, helpful in, in, in uh, understanding the process, but First, the question is, what's the short term and long term in your, uh, you know, what is it that good question. The time yeah, that, that was no... used? And how do you think this is actually representing? I know it's hard to really kind of repeat that experiments, but uh, you're trying to get some insight to it. Uh, and how do you think this is sort of carrying out um, how much it's affecting the actual happening? versus lab experiments? Right, right, good question. So firstly, um, the first question is what time scales are these time scales? I've been pretty vague here, but ultimately the time scales can vary, but what you need to understand is a, a time scale which we call the Maxwell time. And so this is really um, basically a sort of balance between where we think viscous processes happen and elastic processes happen. And that will scale along these different processes. And so really the kind of elastically accommodated sliding, because it is at the cusp of experimental resolution in terms of frequency, we think it happens on the seismic time scale. Mm -hmm. This diffusionally assisted sliding, we think actually happens continuously from the seismic all the way to what we call the Maxwell time, where, where kind of viscous creep starts to enact. And so really we think this is completely continuous between seismic to, you know, depending on where you are in the mantle to kind of hundreds to thousands of years. And around then that's where you might expect more um, maximal flow. And so the problems that we're thinking about, decadal centennial problems, these two processes um, very much are activated when you start melting ice sheets at, at kind of these modern time scale, post-industrial kind of time scales of melts. Um, and we think they might even impact aspects of the deglaciation. So, you know, we know that 25,000 years ago, we had the last glacial maximum, the ice sheets disappeared around 7,000 years ago, but none of that was steady. It was kind of punctuated. And so there were 
there were phases like meltwater pulse 1A, which was a collapse of many ice sheets that caused 20 meters of sea level rise globally within a maximum of 300 years. So even though we kind of see them as modern day timescales across the kind of climate record, these faster timescales are, are acting. Thank you. I'm, I'm actually, I, th I think we should move on to the next talk to stay on track, but the committee has more questions. There are also questions in Slido. If you're in the audience, feel free to add to them because we have time at the end for discussion. Okay, so our next speaker is Shiji Zhang from the University of Colorado in Boulder. And the title of his presentation is GIA modeling with 3D mantle and lithospheric structures. Um, and it looks like he's already up on the screen. So you can start whenever you're ready. Can you hear me well? Yes. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you can you hear me? Oh, oh sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Thanks. I'm gonna turn off the mic now. Okay, yeah. Um so today I'm actually going to talk a little bit about the GI modeling with a 3D uh mantle and the least spherical structure. Uh, I guess earlier um Barbara actually raised this question. Um uh, I Hope I'll actually be able to answer some of you know questions along those lines. Okay, um, of course I like to acknowledge uh, the contribution from my former student and uh, Kai Xuan, and also my current student Tao, uh, and also funding from um, over the years from you know NSF and the NASA. Um, so uh, I thought let's see, let me get my pointer. Yeah, this pointer. Okay, um, so. Uh, this is sort of like a quick uh, short outline for my uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to actually talk a little bit about two of our recent studies on the effect of 3D, uh, you know, 3D effects. Um, and then I'll actually you know, introduce the new open source uh, GI modeling package that is actually publicly available on GitHub. And then towards the end, I'll have one slide, you know, discussing the, you know, the current challenge uh, from 3D GIA uh, modern point of view, okay. Um, then, of course, I uh, really appreciate, you know, uh, quite a few really good talks, uh, you know, um, giving before me and they really gave a lot of really good introduction to the, the kind of topics that I like to touch on. And of course, the 3D mental viscosity, we know the earth is a three dimensional in terms of structure, uh, as we can see from seismic studies in this case is uh, for Antarctic. And that really shows at 300 kilometer depths the dramatic difference between East and West Antarctic, right? And then of course, uh, from this kind of uh, seismic models, um, uh, people actually like to infer for mantle viscosities such as this study by uh, Eric uh, Ivins recently published. Um, then of course you have to have uh, you know a few uh, assumptions about the, the mantle deformation mechanisms, uh, you know I guess the rheological parameters, um, then uh, given you know given the uncertainties, then you actually can have uh, quite some different uh, realizations of three D mantle viscosities, right? Based on different seismic models and the different rheological parameters. Um, there's actually another type of uh, 3D, say, mantle viscosity structure that we think we actually know even probably better, that it's really constrained by various other geophysical and geodynamical uh, processes, uh, such as we know the lithospherical structure or lithospherical thickness varies from mid ocean ridge and to you know, uh, oceans of relatively uh, older age. And we also know the play boundaries that are weak and they tend to decouple place from each other, right? Um, so uh, I'll just give a quick uh, overview uh, on, I guess, the previous studies on effects of 3D uh, uh, viscosity on GIA, okay? This is probably most likely it's an incomplete review and I'll just quickly uh, run through them. And so first there are this type of studies on 3D, I would call temperature dependent viscosities. That is, a uh, it basically takes, the, for example, take the seismic structure, then convert into viscosities and look at the, their effects on the GIA process. And their studies, uh, they actually show that relatively, you know, various uh, 
uh, data that previously cannot be explained, but actually now can be explained by uh, 3D uh, structures, 3D models. So that's always nice, of course. And there are also studies that try to address the question that is to what extent 1D viscosity structure inferred from GI observations uh, actually reflect the 3D, effect, 3D viscosity structure. Uh, the answer to this question, which is an important question, really depends on the nature of the 3D viscosity structure. So it's a bit of a complicated. Uh, then there are also studies look at how 3D viscosity structures, such as the uh, lithospherical thickness variations and play margins, how they actually can influence present day cross motion. That is, uh, keep in mind, uh, this is you know to really to explain the GPS observations, okay. And then there is also this class of studies on three D stress dependent viscosity. Uh, such studies try to reconcile relative sea level and the present day um, you know vertical motion data and for example GPS again using non Newtonian rheology, okay. Um, so I guess. Uh, today, I'm actually going to kind of present two um, uh, two new studies um, uh, that actually really look at how the 3D you know uh, viscosity structure may really influence uh, the GIA processes. Okay, uh, and the first study that actually really you know to look at the, uh, what I actually call the time dependent viscosity. Okay, and uh, you if you think the if you think the problem is already, you know, viscosity is already is already too complicated. Actually, I'm going to add another variable, which I actually think is very much relevant. Um, you know, uh, Harad actually already touched on this a little bit. That is, uh, uh, if you actually consider stress dependent viscosity, then most likely the amount of viscosity is going to be time dependent. That's because of the the stress or GI induced stress uh, is likely time dependent, right? Uh, because you know glaciation histories and all that, and so now uh, in this study uh, we basically you know show you a uh, GI calculation using stress dependent viscosity, right? So we're going to use ice model. Here is a ice six G, right, for full ice you know cycle, and then we use uh, you know this uh, uh, VM five A, uh, which is actually you know for for those who know this. Uh, the VM five A actually, you know, comes together with the I six G ice model, right? And we're actually going to use the VM five A as a background viscosity, but we add stress dependent viscosity for the upper mantle, okay, with exponent of three point five. Um, so here, in this is sort of rheological equation we used here as a composite rheology, uh, and then we use uh, you know, about a hundred hundred bar, uh, yeah, as the transition stress. And uh, we use we ignore the background tectonic stress, okay. And um, so uh, now, you know, I've been uh, kind of doing these clicker questions. Now, I kind of couldn't help to actually pose a question here before we start to show you some results. That is, uh, I ask this question: uh, When is the GIA induced stress in the mantle the largest? The first option is when the surface ice load is largest. That is, uh, for example, at the last glacial maximum. You know, twenty six some thousand years ago, right? You have the thickest ice load on the surface, and that's option A. Answer A. Answer B would be when the rate of deglaciation or glaciation is the largest. In this case, could be say, for example, during uh, melt water pulse one A. That's about fourteen thousand years ago, right? Oh, uh, I just threw this uh, option C. So I wish there were option or answer D. I and so uh, anyway, of course, uh, between an A and B, right? And this are actually kind of a serious considerations. Um, now, okay, well, think about that, right? Give you five seconds. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, yeah, if you teach a lot of, you know, many times in physics classes, this is sort of the clicker questions we like to throw out to students, right? Uh, anyway, I'll show you the answer here, okay? So we did this calculation with GI with a stress dependent viscosity. I'm showing you here um, is actually the ice height uh, at different time, 26,000 uh, years ago, the last glacial maxima. Of course, you see the thickest ice. This is you know, um, right. This is actually you know um, uh, in sort of on North America, right? And then with time, the ice you know 
kind of belt, right? The 14,000 uh, years ago, that's actually when the ice melt the, you know, the rapidest, okay, right? And this, and I guess this is middle column really shows you the stress in the up mantle. Okay, here's the answer. You see that the stress actually is the largest during the, uh, you know, in the this is in the up mantle, right? Um, during, you know, I guess about fourteen thousand years ago. That's actually when the ice melt the rapidest, right? And this shouldn't be too surprised to you because mantle stress depends on the strain rate. And when you have the surface ice melt the fastest, then that's actually when, when you're going to have the largest strain rate in the mantle. And so that will give you the largest stress, right? Now, the last, the third column shows you the effective viscosity at different time. And then shouldn't be surprising, right, to see at this time, 14,000 years ago, the mantle stress, mantle viscosity is significantly reduced by more than one order of magnitude, right? And there's nothing here, you know, really uh, the change, except that here we have stress-dependent viscosity. So the stress or the GI-induced stress itself, in this case, will give you about the effect of 30 viscosity reduction around this time when the, you know, the deglaciation is, you know, rapidest, okay? And then, of course, you get it back to present day, and then the, the stress is so... The, I guess the relaxation is so small, strain rate in mantle is, real, is so small, then you don't really, the viscosity, you know, kind of goes back to VM5A, the background viscosity, okay, right? Um, so that's really, uh, so just sort of saying here, uh, if you start to consider stress-dependent viscosity, uh, then you can actually see significant you know, viscosity reduction at a certain time. In this case, actually during the, uh, during the, um, the I guess, the water, you know, the melt water pulse 1A uh, about 14,000 years ago, okay? And this is what really the non-Newtonian uh, rheology will give to you, okay? If you think about it, the physics, it's actually quite simple. And uh, now let's, so this actually can have quite a significant impact on relative sea level, you know? So I'll just show you, um, you know, I mentioned to you during around 14,000 years ago, right? That's actually when the viscosity reduction, significant you know, viscosity re reduction that occurs. And during that time, you know, if you actually consider non-Newtonian models that are showing you here, this is uh, really for uh, a site uh, frost in Norway, right? And so two calculations, the dash lines and non-Newtonian you know, uh, stress-dependent viscosity calculations, and the solid line is actually for standard Newtonian calculations. Right. Um, so now you actually see during around 14,000 years ago, that's when the viscosity reduction uh, is very significant. And that's actually, so that actually will give you a very rapid sea level falls compared to the Newtonian models. Right. Um, so um, uh, it turns out, of course, if you go look at the far side, you know, uh, that is the far field uh, sort of sites. Uh, and this is a, uh, now this, in this case, um, yeah, the Newtonian models and the non-Newtonian models, they give you almost identical results. Uh, that is actually the reason it's quite simple. When you're actually far away from the ice, and, or, uh, uh, you know, ice sheet, right, the far field, and then you know, the GI-induced stress there in the mantle is very small. So that's not going to change the, you know, the viscosity that much. Uh, so then you actually, Newtonian models and non-Newtonian models for the far side actually will give you almost identical results, okay? Um, so now let, let's look at the data a little bit. Um, so I already showed you, you know, this, you know, this site. Now I plot the data here, and it turns out that actually, if you look at the actual data, and the sea level falls, you know, much more rapidly than the prediction from the, you know, uh, the Newtonian model, that is the Dick Power TS I60 plus VM5A. And this slope, of the sea level curve here, actually kind of very similar to what the non-Newtonian model actually predict, right? So that's, you know, um, and then now if you look at many other sites, you know, whether in, you know, Finiscandia or in, uh, you know, in North America, and you actually see uh, many, many of the, you know, uh, sites, you see this, uh, what we call the L-shaped curves, that is, uh, uh, you know, there are certain times the sea level falls very rapidly, then kind of go to kind of really 
at a much gentler slope, okay? And uh, we think this is actually maybe indication of the non-Newtonian reality is working, okay, right? And so it's a really, um, uh, it's an interesting point, okay? Uh, now I'm gonna actually move to, uh, you know, another, the second uh, problem that, you know, uh, that is uh, uh, to think about the GIA you know, process with weak play margins and the play, you know, um, the disciplical thickness variations. Uh, we actually, I'm gonna argue that and you know this uh, can really modulate plate tectonic process on more like a ten thousand year time scale. And we know that plate tectonics, of course, it's it's relatively uh, it's really driven by mantle convection, and it occurs on much longer geological time scale. And the question here is that uh, now you have this GIA process, right? The glacial cycles. Um, uh, that is to what extent? Right, the GIA process actually will modulate uh, the plate tectonic process, right? Um, so now I already showed you, uh, this is a sort of a three-dimensional structure that we're going to consider in this GIA calculations. And I should mention that previously, uh, other you know, uh, researchers actually, they also look at this problem, but mostly they want to understand is effect on present day um, the crustal motion. Yeah, I'm actually talking about the horizontal crustal motion. That is uh, to try to explain the GPS kind of you know, observation. Okay, right. And so uh, here actually we're more interested in the question that is uh, over this uh, glacial cycle time scale overall, how this uh, play thickness variations and the weak play margins actually would influence uh, the uh, let's say the horizontal motion of the, uh, you know, GI induced horizontal motion. Okay, right. Uh, and so we use, you know, again, we use the I6G as a forcing and we use the VM5A, um, you know, as a sort of background viscosity structure. Then, but we added the reciprocal thickness variation, we could play margins about 100 kilometer wide. And uh, we also consider our very thin uh, exonosphere in this case. Um, and uh, here, we actually also consider compressible uh, mantle and also even consider crust 1.0. So find, you know, pretty refined model. And we could do this because we actually can compute, uh, you know, very efficiently, very high resolution numerical models. So we're talking about here globally, we're using about a 30 kilometer horizontal resolution, about a 10 kilometer vertical resolution. And we're using about a 35 million element to resolve the play boundaries and and you know and the reciprocal thicknesses. Okay, I'm going to talk about the code that the uh, you know we used here right later on. And so uh, now let's actually look at the these two cases. The one actually is a is a case with a 1D viscosity structure. This is sort of the you can say this is more like a similar to the standard uh, you know uh, VM5A the GI models, right? And then the 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 you know this I guess the case. Uh, here, actually, uh, to the right is the three got a three D viscosity, you know, viscosity structures. I uh, was what I showing you here. The color is the divergency of the horizontal uh, motion, okay, and the vectors, of course, is the horizontal, you know, um, horizontal motions, right? Um, so first, you see actually the scale is different for the vectors uh, when you actually introduce weak play margins. Uh, and this, you know the reciprocal thickness variations, and you actually really see the vectors, the 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 horizontal motions, you know, really increase dramatically. Okay, and you also start to see the in this case the play boundaries and uh, the divergence, right? The blue color means actually, you know, it really means that uh, there's a convergence going on. And you look at the GI induced the horizontal motion is not surprising because we're actually seeing the North America play has some kind of a, Sort of con you know clockwise rotation, right? Um, so that actually gives you negative convergence along the the North, the North Atlantic you know, spreading centers, right? Um, so um, now the, the point here is really the three D you know can have a very large effect on the horizontal motion compared to one D. This is actually for present day, okay, right? Uh, this is for present day. Now let's focus on 3D model, but look back in time, okay? So this is 8,000 years ago, and this is 14,000 years ago, right? Um, now the color again is really the divergence, but now with a different scale, they actually, uh, you know, actually, I think I made a mistake here. Actually, it's a scale, oh yeah, it's a different scale, yeah. It's a larger scale, you know, right? From negative three 
to positive three times 10 to the minus eight per year, okay? Uh, what actually you see, you know, in say 8,000 years ago in this case, uh, now the, again, the, you know, the scale is different for vectors, right? Uh, not just the divergence, also for the velocity vectors. And now the velocity vectors significantly increased, right? And, and also you start, to, you start to see a lot of internal deformation uh, that is, you know, as you know, as we can see from the divergence in this at this time, the green line actually has had a lot of deglaciation. So you see a lot of, you know, sort of divergence or deformation surrounded green line. And and I I would also like to point out here even um, because green line is so close to Iceland, and the deglaciation of the green line actually caused the opening of Atlantic, uh, you know, mid ocean ridge system across the Iceland even here, okay. Um, so then, then, of course, you going back in time. Um, so 14,000 years ago, I can actually, we're actually using the, now the scale is a 20 millimeter or two centimeter per year vector scale here, okay, right? There's a, now in this case, in North America, uh, the, you know, this is really when you have a, a very large deglaciation going on in North America continent, right? Then you have a lot of internal deformation, very strong, and the vectors, horizontal, motion vector, you know, it's more than two, three centimeter per year, right? And then you further going back in, you know, in time 21,000 years ago, right? And then this is actually about uh, 110,000 years ago that actually during the glaciation time. And you actually see, uh, you know, a lot of uh, you may consider as a play motion, that is a play rotation, right? For example, one, 110,000 years ago, you see the security uh, counterclockwise, Rotation, right? That actually give you the um, kind of concentrate, uh, you know, divergence uh, at along the middle ocean ridge systems. Okay, and so now what we want to actually do is to kind of further quantify um, the GI induced horizontal crust motion in comparison with the, the tectonic plate motion, right? And so this is actually what we Sorry, have. Sorry, Shiji, I, I'm just going to interrupt for a second because we're running uh, fairly long right now. So if you could wrap oh, up in three minutes. Uh, we also have a lot of great questions coming in. So I want to make sure we have time for that. Thank you. Okay. I apologize for this. Okay. I think I'm actually getting fairly close to the end. Okay. Um, so now uh, here, actually, I'm just showing you the ratio of GI-induced you know, plate rotation to the tectonic rotation for North America, okay? Uh, 1D models, dash nine 3D models, the three, uh, the solid line for, you know, 3D models. Um, so I just want to really you to look at the, about, a, you know, 10,000 years ago, um, you see this, uh, the ratio is up, you know, it's getting to about uh, 25%. So which means that the GI induced, you know, uh, plane motion for North America is really reached to about 25% of the tectonic plane motion, okay? It's quite a sub, uh, significant, right? And uh, now this is the showing the angle between these two vectors, you know, rotation vectors for GI induced the play motion and the you know the tectonic play motion. And so the, the quick point here is that uh, for the last uh, ten thousand years, and then we see this angle between these two vectors is uh, you know close to one hundred eighty or one hundred forty degrees. That means these two. Motions that actually, you know, the kind of you know GI induced motion opposed plate tectonic motion, um, but and there are also there are also other times the GI induced motion enhance the plate motion. That is when this two and when this angle between the two vectors is relatively small. Okay, um, so uh, I guess here I just want to also show you very quickly that is if you actually quantify the spreading rate induced by GIA and then ratio that to the tectonic spreading rate for the slow uh, or ultra slow spreading centers and such as, you know, Iceland, the Southwest Indian Ridge. And you actually see there are times uh, when the this ratio reached to almost like 40%. Uh, that is uh, the GI induced the spreading, uh, spreading rate actually can be up to 40% of the tectonic ones. And, and you also can see that it can really swing, time dependent swing back you know, from positive to negative ones, okay? And this can have a significant in, implications for volcanism history for Iceland, for example. And we also find that there's actually this, uh, you know, after one full glacial cycle, there's actually net or actual seafloor production, which means the degassing, including C CO2s after a full glacial cycle, right? 
And so now I just want to quickly talk a little bit about this code that we've been using. Okay, I'm just going to say this is a finite element code, right? It actually works on three dimensional temperature, stress, dependent viscosity, and using this, uh, you know, long uniform um, kind of grids, uh, right? And so, it, you know, really provide a, you know, very good resolution, right? And, so, uh, and then I'll say this, you know, this code really, you know, runs very efficiently. Um, you know, PC clusters, and uh, also massively parallel, com you know, computers. Like over, we did a test uh, over six thousand, you know, cores, and and this is, you know, uh, this is open source. And uh, you know, there's users guide example cases. Uh, the public available at this GitHub. Anyone can go to download, right? And we actually also plan it to run some, um, possibly online users, um, you know, workshops, you know, uh, Zoom, right? And so um, I guess uh, now this is, you know, this is just the history of what is our capacity of this code. We don't need to, uh, you know, talk much about this, right? And rather, I just want to really show you, uh, this is the kind of, uh, you know, test case we did, uh, you know, for, uh, this is running for like more than 6,000 CPUs and, and, you know, with efficiency, you know, close to the 80%, okay, right? Uh, you know, some benchmark. And um, so for this, I guess maybe you can just trust me, uh, uh, you know, uh, on my words, that is very accurate, okay? And um, this is all being published, document, right? The second order accuracy, okay? And this is for single harmonic, you know, the love number calculations for single harmonic, uh, at, you know, with different resolutions. And then this is actually the, uh, this is the benchmark for the, you know, I6G, the VM5A. And I actually want to point out again here in this case, um, for this case, for this particular model with very high resolution, right? As I mentioned, about 35 million elements, about a 30 kilometer, uh, you know, uh, horizontal resolution. Um, you know, we, it, it, it took about, uh, uh, about 10 hours, okay? Um, it's not days or weeks, right? 10 hours uh, using about uh, 400 CPUs, okay, right? Um, I guess really, I don't feel like I needed to mention this challenge on uh, this particular case again, that is, is a problem that is, uh, uh, you know, the ice model and the you know one D viscosity model, they're all coupled, right? The fit of the data, and then which basically means that anytime you try to use a three dimensional structure that deviated from the one D viscosity, you're going to call, you're going to actually reduce the fit of the data, okay, right? Unless you revise ice model, I think this is a big challenge. I'm pretty sure, you know, it's been already discussed. Uh, you know, by previous speakers, um, you know, so I'm pretty sure Glenn probably will talk about this as well. Okay, right. And then, of course, I always feel like this is a community benchmark effort is important. I know, uh, you know, Rebecca is actually organized this. It is very important. Okay, so I think that's all I have. Um, so this is really just to recap what I have said. You know, I guess I apologize if we actually run a bit of over time. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, we are going to go straight to the next talk uh, without questions at this time. But if you have, um, if the audience has questions, please keep putting them in Slido and uh, we will have time at the end for a discussion. So the final talk of this session is going to be given by Glenn Milne of the University of Ottawa. And his title is Ice Model Development Challenges and Paths Forward. You can start whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Um... Just gotta find my slide. Okay. Can you speak up a little bit? Uh, it's a little faint, um, yeah, sure. so it might be for the audience as well. Thank you. Yeah, is that better? Yeah, it's a little better. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry. I'm I'm using the mic on my laptop. My <clears throat> actual microphone uh, died. Okay. Let me. Uh, can you see my screen and my pointer? Okay. Yes, looks great. Thank you. Okay. So th this is a very broad kind of re review and, and look forward about the ICE model side of things. And, and I appreciate that the COSEG is very much solid earth focused, but uh, you, you can't separate ICE and earth and GIA modeling. Um, it, they're coupled as many people have already talked about. So I'm going to focus a little bit on the ICE model and I'll, that'll be like the first 10, 12 minutes of the talk. And then I'm going to talk a bit about kind of a wrap up kind of where we're at and how I see things moving forward and kind of summarizing some of the stuff that's already been said, but really looking forward, where's the where's the field going and what are some of the more interesting initiatives and in moving forward? So let me jump right in. Um, 
why is it not moving? I don't seem to be able to change my slides. Ah, okay. So just a quick, quick summary of ice sheets and what they are and what they're sensitive to. They're, they're very complicated physical systems. Um, you basically got your ice sheet and it interacts on its different boundaries. It interacts with the atmosphere and climate, essentially. That's one of the more important interactions. It interacts with the oceans, your temperature, and, and also ice at the grounding line of flotation and things like that. And it also interacts with the solid earth, which is very much the focus of, of my talk and, and GIA type studies. Because the, the elevation on this bottom surface will pu push the ice sheet higher or lower, which will impact how it in, 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 uh, interacts with the climate system. So really, our, our, our job as a, as a community in terms of solid earth ice interactions is better constraining this lower boundary and what it's doing and how it makes the ice sheet evolve over time. So that's really where we're coming from in, in our, our, our field. Now, in terms of constraining these ice models, there's different data sets that we can pull from, and Rebecca's already touched on this a little bit. But I just want to separate it out into two classes of data. There's data that tells you directly about where the ice was and when, and that's really from glacial geology and marine geophysics. That's independent of Earth structure, Earth rheology, and that makes it, these are nice data because they're direct constraints. So Jeff asked earlier, can you build a model that's independent of the Earth? Well, we could but we'd have to focus really on these data sets only. And even then you still have to model ice sheets and when you model them, you have to account for that lower boundary. So you still, you can't, it's not possible to basically generate ice models without thinking about the isostatic response, but you could focus on data sets that are less sensitive to that part of the response. And the, the typical GIA type data sets that have already been discussed, so sea level changes and GPS data and things like that, they're, they're typical GIA data sets. So they're very sensitive to what the Earth is doing and therefore the rheology. And, the, you know, uh, we also bring in constraints from glaciology because there's a lot of interesting physics going on here, and that's really captured in glaciological models. That it's like a parallel research field that kind of, that we try and interact with, but ultimately is developed by itself. But I think in, at re, in recent times, our community and their community are starting to work together to couple these models. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, and for the Antarctic and the Greenland ice sheets, we can also get useful information from ice core records because those ice sheets are still around. And the ice core records give us useful information on their history. Uh, but so just, just to kind of follow on from that, there's really two ways we generate these ice sheet models, and they're very different. So on the left, so I just picked this slide because it was handy. It's from a paper uh, from 10 years ago. But on one side, you actually run full glaciological models that incorporate all the physics, and you get, you get basically, you get ice evolution through time. This is just a particular time. I think it's the last glacial maximum. Eh? It's like 20,000 years ago. And, and so th this method is one way to do it, but it's time consuming because you have to run these glaciological models are computationally intensive. And so, you know, you can't, it's difficult to explore the parameter space, but all the physics is in there. An easier way to do it, and you could argue a more a direct way to do it. And this is how, for example, the ice five, six, seven G models are made and largely how the, the Kurt Lambeck makes his models. You essentially take a, a grid and you just hand tune the ice thickness to fit sea level or GPS data. There's, there's really no glaciology in these models. It's really just fitting the rebound data. That's it. Now, the nice, nice thing about this is it's very direct, very simple. And you can, you know, you're, and you can, you can fit the kind of margin constraints and things like that, but there's really no glaciology in here. So you know, the pros and cons to each approach, and I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I'm just saying, just to let you guys know, there's been these two parallel approaches that that have been used and sometimes there's kind of halfway houses as well where a bit of both are, have been employed. So um, so I guess the, an, an important point here is that the resulting model will depend on the isostatic response. In this case, because it's really fitting GIA data, which is telling you a lot about the isostatic response. And in this case, because in these, in these glaciological models, the bed response is built into the physics. So you, you can't make an ice model independently of Earth structure. That's kind of the key point. So, and Lambert already mentioned that answering Jeff's question. Unfortunately, we can't be independent of the solid Earth. 
So that's how you build up a regional ice sheet model. But obviously, we're looking at global models. And the way we do that is we basically take different regional reconstructions, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, and we add them together, run them through our models, and then we try and fit data from places like in equatorial regions like Barbados, Tahiti, blah, blah, blah. And right now, the community is trying to address a problem where if you add together our best estimates of regional models, we get a sea level rise that's 10 or 20 meters less than you see in these data sites. So we're not, we don't have enough ice in these models. And this is a big problem that we're trying to figure out, but we don't have an answer to it yet. And if anyone's interested, there's been a couple of papers that have talked about this issue, but we haven't solved it yet. Um, so, so the the models we have are, are are you know we have what we have. But I'm just telling you that they have some big issues. Um, so now I want to focus in a bit more on the ice, the Earth ice model interaction because, you know, the focus of this meeting is really about Earth models and how we understand the rheology. But the ice models are coupled, or they they depend on the Earth models and. And as we push the ice models to make them more realistic with lateral structure and time-dependent viscosities, we have to try and make sure the ice models are keeping up or else they're going to get disconnected in some way. And this has already been mentioned by Shiji and others. Because a lot of the ice models that the community has available to them are based on 1D spherically symmetric Earth models. And that basically means that these ice models are biased, right? Because they're ignoring lateral structure. And just to kind of make to make that point uh, kind of explicit, this is a model prediction of sea level 10,000 years ago in kind of eastern Canada and northern northeastern US. And this is a 3D model output minus a 1D model output for the same radial viscosity structure. So the only difference between these models is the lateral variations in viscosity. And if you look at this scale bar, we're seeing hundreds of meters of gradient in sea level that the 1D models are not capturing, right? So that means, so, and th this, this is kind of obvious, you're going from cold cratonic regions like Hudson Bay out to coastal areas with much thinner lithosphere and warmer temperatures, lower viscosities. And a 1D model will try and average that structure. But when you average it, then you're, all, you're gonna be biased. So I guess the point I'm making here is if you take a 1D model that ignores this variability, and tune your ice model, your ice model is going to be wrong and quite significantly wrong. We're getting differences order 100 meters. That's like a 20% error. So your ice thickness is going to be off by 20% at LGM, roughly the first order. So this is a major issue that the community has to deal with. Now we, we're, we're pushing these more sophisticated earth models, but we're using ice models that are wrong because they're based on 1D earth models. And I think that's really a major challenge that we have to address as a community. Um, and that, so this summary, that's a major bottleneck in moving forward with these more sophisticated models. So how do we deal with this issue? Well, there's, I'm just going to highlight three ways. And I, I should point out that the stuff I'm talking about isn't necessarily things I'm doing in my own research. This is the, these are community efforts. Some I'm involved in, some I'm not. I'm just highlighting what I see as ways that will probably, you know, lead to very uh, solid and useful results in the next five to 10 years. So one way to deal with this is to actually explicitly use the 3D Earth models to tell to, you know, so if you if you build an ice, ice sheet model and a 1D Earth model, you have to tell your 1D Earth model what error it's making. So you have to tell it what the structural error is it's making. And Taras, Lev Tarasov and colleagues that can actually do that. They can build in this estimate of structural error and they can then incorporate that when they're estimating these ice sheet histories. So that's one way to do it. And Lev is doing that now and he's been doing it. So that, that's very positive. Um, it's not ideal because it doesn't bring in the information from the 3D model to improve the ice model. To do that, you really need a fully coupled ice model, earth model, and an earth model with 3D structure, right? And this is a very young field, but it has a lot of promise. And for example, people like Natalia Gomez, uh, Van Kalker et al. out in the Netherlands, and Albrecht et al. in Potsdam, they're coupling proper glaciological ice sheet models to full 3D GIA models. And so that's kind of that's kind of state of the art, but that raises issues because these models are very computationally expensive. So you can't explore the parameter space. You can run them and look for very crude sensitivities, but you're limited. So I think the community has to seek ways to make that 
process more efficient. And one, there's some ways to do that. I just want to highlight one. This is a 2D model that tries to simulate what a 3D model can do, but it's much more computationally efficient. And also, I think uh, Lambert mentioned this machine learning. There's been a couple of very pre preliminary studies that are showing that we can apply machine learning to GIE problems. There's still a lot of work to do, but these early studies show a lot of potential and they could help us explore the parameter space and do that coupling more efficiently if you can emulate the 3D structure, how it impacts the ice history. And the last thing I want to point out is this, uh, there's uh, a joint methods that are often used in seismology. So I think these have a lot of potential. A recent paper by Crawford et al. So Ophelia Crawford with David Alatar in Cambridge, they, they developed, they basically took the, this uh, joint method and I've developed a theory to apply it to GIA problems. And this holds a huge amount of potential moving forward, not just for constraining the ice model, but also for looking at the earth model 3D structure. And it's a very efficient way to look at the sensitivities of your ice model or to your data to ice history. And I just wanted to show a quick slide on that. So this was provided by Evelyn Powell at Columbia, who's working with uh, Andrew Lloyd and Jackie Osterman. Uh, it's, it's work in progress, so it's still ongoing, but basically you take a 3D Earth model. This is an example for Antarctica. And there's a GPS station down here somewhere where my little pointer is. And you can calculate these kernels for that location, for that data point, And it tells you what your time and spatial sensitivity is to the ice history. So for a 3D model, you're getting ice history sensitivity around that point, but you can see that you're really much in the yellows and blues. So beyond about, you know, a lot of that sensitivity is very recent change in the ice sheet. If you take a 1D model, you can see the sensitivity becomes much older. So this is a really powerful technique to tell you at any given data point what your sensitivity is to the ice history in space and time. And I think this has a lot of potential moving forward. You can take these kernels to do inversions for ice thickness changes through time. Okay, so uh, moving forward in terms of you know addressing this issue and making these uh, ice sheet models compatible with these kind of state-of-the-art 3D Earth models, you can look at it in two ways, the data side and the model side. So data side, I think really, and this is just my personal opinion, but I think the two, big, the two ice sheets that we need to pin down better are Antarctica, because it's very data sparse, and North America, because it's so large and covers a lot of space, right? We need better control on those ice sheets in terms of margin position and chronology. Um, and in West Antarctica, essentially any low viscosity regions, we need better control on the recent ice history because that's what the data are more sensitive to, particularly the GPS data. You're not really seeing back far in time. You're seeing a few thousand years in some places, and that's due to the low viscosity. We need better control on, on recent ice history changes. And the one last thing I wanted to highlight is, you know, we, we have all the data from Antarctica or from North America or Greenland or wherever, and that, that's important data. I'm not, you know, we, we need that data. But you can also learn a lot if you have data further afield. And I want to just highlight a recent study that is in review, and this is from uh, Yudita Mukherjee, who was at Tulane University with Tor Tonquist. So they looked at very precise sea level records at four locations around the planet. These are, these are the four locations. And, they, and specifically they looked at rate of change of sea level at these different locations. And they compared this to different ice sheet models that are shown here along the X axis. And they found that your typical ice sheet models, ANU, ice 5, 6, 7, G, they're, they're not giving enough melt. They're not melting fast enough to really capture these rates in the sea level data. And specifically what these data are telling us that we need more melting from North America, that's the red stuff, compared to Antarctica, which is the blue stuff, the blue part of the column. So, and that's like the opposite of what we had 10 or 20 years ago, looking at these models. So these data are very important for partitioning, like globally partitioning and telling us where the melt's coming from at any particular period in time. And this only covers like nine to 7,000 years ago, but it tells us that the models we're using are, are wrong. So not only are they wrong spatially, but they're wrong chronologically as well, and quite significantly. So we need more of this high precision data. So that's just me thinking top of my head in terms of data, what we need to move forward. In terms of modeling, I think there's really three things we need to push, and that's um, continued development, testing, and applications of these coupled ice earth models with 3D earth structure, and hopefully eventually 
non-Maxwell rheologies because, you know, transient non-linear flow is going to play a role as well. And we need to um, continue methods of development to, you know, to uh, improve the efficiency of these coupled models because they're just too intensive computationally. We need to explore that perhaps. So uh, machine learning and, and other approaches that are a bit more efficient. And this a joint method, I think, has a lot of potential moving forward as well, because it really targets where your sensitivities are for a given data set. So that's my icy part finished. How much time do I have, uh, Jessica? Uh, you can go about three minutes longer. Three minutes, okay. So I was asked to put in this slide because, you know, we're passing the torch to the younger generation and... Um, there's been training schools offered for over like 2015, 1923, sponsored by these sponsors are on top, thanks to the sponsors. But we'd like to run more of these schools. This is from Stephanie Sherman at OSU. Um, so I'm just like to encourage colleagues that when they put in funding applications, ask for money to support training schools um, because they're really like, they're always oversubscribed and the feedback is super positive. So we just, you know, and a lot of the work I'm talking about here is, is led by younger scientists. So we really need to push that and get more of these training schools happening. Okay, so the last, I can't see the title. I think this is wrap up, right? So I'm, I'm going to go through this quickly because hopefully it'll lead into the discussion, right? I, I think that's going to be more important. But just to summarize a few things. So as, as Harriet said, GIA is a beautiful macro rheology experiment on different time scales, right? And I think we can learn from GI in terms of what the Earth like inside on these time scales, and the models that we're developing now can really start probing that, as Harriet mentioned. It also gives us constraints on ice and sea level evolution that's essential to understand the climate system, and it, it products for end user communities, not just geodesists. I was asked to talk to geodesists, but also the paleo climate community. They need GA model predictions to interpret their data. So. We, you know, we're focused on, we're making these models more accurate. You know, we're building in 3D earth structure. We're looking at time variable viscosity. We're looking at coupling ice to earth. That, these are all great things and they're going to help us move forward and get more accurate models. And the other good thing about that is if we build in the physics, we can actually engage better with other communities like seismologists and the mineral physicists. We can take their constraints like Barry was talking about and we can start a discussion, you know, and go back and forth, macro, micro, are we getting the same answers or not? So that's the good side of these more complicated models, but there's always a bad side. And the bad side is greater complexity, more model parameters, longer run times. You can't explore the parameter space, more non-uniqueness, right? GIA has always been plagued by non-uniqueness because you have the ice and the earth and there's ways to try and attack that problem, but uh, as you make the models more complex, that problem only blows up. So that's really the issue I think the community has to deal with in the coming decade, non-uniqueness with these more sophisticated models. Um, so I'm going to end with this. Um, so Harriet talked about Greenland, and Greenland hasn't had enough attention, I think, so far. So Harriet talked about the GPS records there. It's a beautiful data set, um, really important to understand what's going on in Greenland. And the data are shown here as the black symbols. So we take what we think is a good GA model and we get the open circles. And you can see the fit is terrible. And so we've been trying to understand this. Why, why is it such a poor fit? You know, what's, we're not, obviously we're missing some physics or, or the model, the data set is something. So we've been exploring that recently. And to try and understand that one hypothesis, the one Harriet mentioned is you can explain it if you bring in transient viscosity and say that viscosity on shorter time scales is lower and there's a large post little ice age signal. So that's one way to explain it, right? There are, are other hypotheses here you have to test. So the elast so these data are corrected for elastic deformation during the GPS time series. That correction is not easy to make and you assume an elastic response. So that's another aspect that's probably needs to be looked at more carefully because the rates seem to be coming down as more as more recent updates to the data are published. And also, and this was this is recent work, I think Harriet's familiar with this. So uh, Linda Pan at Harvard with Jerry Mitrovica say if you, if you put in finer viscosity structure shallow in the earth, you can also explain this problem. You don't need transient. It's another, so basically a thin low viscosity zone beneath the lithosphere can also explain this difference. 
And recent work in my own group is showing that if you had lateral structure, you can also explain these data without transient rheology. I'm not saying one is correct and the others are wrong. I'm saying it's probably a combination of all three. And this is a beautiful il illustration of this non-uniqueness. We don't know what the real answer is, but we need to keep working and talking to each other, bringing in other data sets to find out. So these, I think these are ways forward with that. And I'm gonna stop here because this is gonna lead into the discussion anyway, but I think these are aspects that I'd like to discuss with the committee and with other colleagues and with anyone who's listening online. So I'm gonna stop there, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. That was a really nice example to end the talk on. Um, before we start the general discussion, I actually uh, wanted to ask you to just give a little bit more context about the training school that you mentioned. Um, this committee is is interested in the um, training and education component. And if you could see what the funding model is for that, um, is that well, an actually, ongoing school um, yeah, that right. is held on a regular basis? And how does that work? Is Rebecca still here or is she going to bed? Rebecca, are you still here? Because Rebecca yes, is actually I don't. I, uh, yes, She's I'm hosting. still here. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. If you can hear me, I can um, yeah. um, shortly say something. So this training school was the first time in 2009 and 2011, 2015, 2019, 2023. Um, we are actually hoping to have one in 2027 and 2031 at least. Um, funding was usually... Uh, for the past three schools, we are the Ponet NSF program, um, but also many others stepped in, like IOTG, EGU, IAG, IX, um, yeah, Polar Canada last time. So it was usually many funding agencies contributing to it, which made us made it possible to really make it a free event for those coming to the meeting. Um, or to the school uh, so that we could really uh, find the students that were really good enough to attend or needed also the school. So we had uh, applications of more than 100 people and we had only 40 seats. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I think we, I know the committee has a lot of uh, questions. I think, uh, Austin, I think, is indicating he wants to ask something. So yeah, do you thanks. want to go? Thanks, Glenn. This great exploration of some of the interesting connections and trade-offs. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on the ice model side, where you, you've shown that people have run glaciologically sort of consistent models and compared those with best fit models. Now, if you look at the differences between the two that are considered robust, where you go like, hmm, why? Are those differences that may then indeed be due to the Earth structure where like, ah, this is a region where 3D variations in viscosity matter? Or are there a lot of other places where there's a real mismatch between our understanding of the dynamics of these ice models and what the best fit would be? It's really, Carson, it's really different things. I mean, very few groups are doing the coupled modeling. That's really in its infancy. So I don't know really enough out there to start seeing why they're different. Um, but the two examples I show, that just illustrates data sparsity for one thing. So in the middle of Canada, you have no data to constrain the thickness of the ice or very little. And you could, you know, if you have a different, so, you know, I showed one glaciological model and one that's more just fine hand tuning the thickness to fit the GIA data. But the bottom line is there really no data in the middle of Canada where you can really estimate that thickness or, okay, GPS, there's some GPS stations, but they're very sparse. So it's really a data, a data sparsity issue, and it's particularly in Canada because we just don't have enough GPS constraints. It's, so what, what about the edges sort of around things, right? Where you might so be the a edges bit more... are better constrained because that's where generally you have information on where the ice margin was at different times. You have sea level data and you have GPS as well. You have, you have multiple data sets. So you can really pin things down better at the margins. It's really when you get into the interior and, and Canada is a bit of an end, or North America is a bit of an end member because it is so big and there's very little data in the middle. And actually moving forward, what I'd like to see is, is a better population of more, more GPS sites, maybe the use of INSAR. I think Rebecca showed an INSAR example to really start to fill out these space. Okay, it's only a present day snapshot, but at least it's a constraint. Yeah. 
Uh, we're going to go to Meng Han next. Uh, thank you for your talk. So you showed how important is it to consider 3D and 1D and how much improvement we got. So I was wondering how about that with depth? Oh, you mean viscosity with depth? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the results I showed, were, these were full global models. Um, um, so you could take in a different global model based on a different seismic model, and you see slight differences, and sometimes not so slight differences. It depends where you're looking. But, um, you know, I mean, every ice sheet is a difference. Well, you have North America that's huge, that's sensitive way down into the shallow part of the lower mantle. And then you've got, say, the Greenland ice sheet that really only sees the upper mantle. And then you've got the British ice sheet, which probably only sees the upper, upper mantle. So depending on the ice sheet and the area you're talking about, you know, the depth information is let more or less important. But 3D, yeah, it's hard to say. And that's where I think these adjoint kernels are going to be super useful because at any given observation point, they'll tell us what your sensitivity is to structure at different depths. And that's going to be really neat. And I really think that's going to be a game changer. I'm not involved in that research. <laughs> I'm plugging it for other colleagues, but I mean, I'd love to be, but that's really going to really going to change the field significantly. Thank you. Thank Harry, oh, we're going to go to Jeff next. Oh. Yeah, I have a question for Harriet. Um, so in your model, you had obviously both spatial and temporal or timescale variations, I should say, uh, in effective viscosity. And the question is, is the magnitude of the time variations in effective viscosity in a place like Iceland that is overall low viscosity, is is does that also see orders of magnitude change when we look at, at like you saw for Greenland in your case, or would it be larger or smaller in a place where the viscosity is overall lower? Oh, good question. So. If these experimental laws are right, I think in hotter places, the difference is muted. Um, but also you're you're shifting the Maxwell time to you know faster time scale. So those processes are happening even faster than you think. And so there's a bit of a, a temperature dependence on the transient as well. Again, if these experimental models are are correct. Um, yeah. So, so, for example, for Iceland, what kind of range uh, over, I guess, well, something that, you know, on hundred, let's say tens of thousands of years, it, it's, it fully relaxes anyway, I guess, <laughs> regardless. But, but um, yeah, what sort of a timescale difference might we see in a place like Iceland if we're looking at uh, a, a really short timescale process versus a, let's say, thousand year timescale process? Um, I'm actually not sure. Um, maybe mainly because on thousand times, thousands of years time scale, it probably would relax quicker because it's low viscosity. So you might not be able to disentangle those um, those signatures, at least observationally. Theoretically, we could say there are probably differences. Whether whether we'd be able to see them is another is another question. So I actually, off the top of my head, don't know. Um, but Iceland is an interesting case. And, you know, obviously there are ice caps that are melting at different rates, but it's also undergoing other processes, like the tides, ocean tides in Iceland are massive. And so you can sort of get forcings that can give you indications of non-elastic rheology at the kind of hourly time scale. So, so it's an interesting rich area, but also a very complicated area because there's a lot of melt. There's, a, you, you know, all these things that start throwing things off, throwing you off. Um, but yeah, I hope that kind of gave you a bit of an, at least some uh, intuition on it. Um, I had a question for Glenn, is that okay? Or, or at least like a little follow-up to what you were discussing. You have the microphone. I do have the, I, I, I won't turn it off. I'll just keep it on and hog this just, just briefly. <laughs> but it was interesting when Torsten asked you about constraining the ice model in other ways. And I've just come across some really recently interesting papers that, again, it's just not in my field, so I don't really know. But there are, you know, you can sort of explore the drainage patterns, right, through time. And so if there's a sort of, flux into the Gulf of Mexico that sort of indicates a retreat of the Laurentide. And, you know, if the fluxes are into the Arctic Ocean, maybe that's an advance. And so are these sorts of constraints, these kind of more geochemical constraints, 
could these yeah, be no, worked that's a good in? Point. Um, some ice models, and I know Lev Tarasov, he has basically a hydrology component in his right. glaciological model, and he can predict these signals, and therefore he can use these data. And they don't all do it, but I think uh, it's information that can be used if you have it built into your model, and it can be very powerful. Um, I actually had a question for um, Harriet about um, the the model, the rheology model that's in there, which is based on diffusion mechanisms. Um, and I think a lot of that drives from work on attenuation, in fact. And in the last five years or so, there's been a lot of work on um, dislocation mechanisms and things like low temperature plasticity, which um, is is really another way that you can, um, in some of the recent dislocation models, get at transient creep. And I'm wondering if you've looked at implicating any of those newer models into this. Yeah, um, a lot, very interesting, a lot of interesting work going on. I've been talking to kind of Lars Hansen about these sorts of mechanisms, for example, these L LTP, low temperature plasticity. Yeah, I, I mean, I currently don't. Um, they do add an element of complexity. And I, I think, these models are currently in their somewhat infancy in terms of being able to like, I, I, I mean, they've been applied in a few cases, I, I understand, but not in GIA so much, right? Um, but they would be very interesting and you certainly reach the stress levels that would activate these processes. Um, it's interesting because so much of the rock physics community as a, a lot of those papers, firstly, as someone not, in that community, I find the literature, like I, I need to really read it about 70 times before I really understand what's going on. And I still don't because I haven't read it 70 times. <laughs> but then also, you know, a lot, of, you, you mentioned attenuation, a lot of that, those experiments were geared towards seismology to explain the attenuation of waves and how dispersion happens in terms of how do you move from a seismic tomography model and actually interpreting that model in terms of the physics underlying physics and i think that's the bridge right we have a vs model a pretty picture but what does that mean and so because those experiments were sort of performed to the audience of attenuation to the audience of seismologists it's hard for to be to be picked up we don't talk about attenuation even though that's ultimately what's happening. We talk about viscosity, we talk about viscous dash parts. We, so the language, there's a little bit of a, a disconnect. And I think Glenn said it at the end is to be able to talk to these different communities. I think that would really help. So yeah, dislocation for sure at some point. Um, great. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think also sometimes there's a feeling that um, in the rock deformation community that the you know, the diffusional mechanisms can be easier to implement in the attenuation experiments. I think that's really the only regime that they could access for those measurements, but that the dislocation mechanisms, that dislocation driven mechanisms seem to be what, what dominates a lot of rheology, but they are, they, they, I understand that they introduce a lot of complexity in the models that they're very nonlinear. And um, I, you know, yes, that, that it, you know, you guys have done a nice job in the session of showing how much the computational power requirements increase um, when you add in all these complexities. Um, we have a, um, I'm gonna do a question next for Shiji out of the chat. This is from Aidan Janney, um, who said, thanks for a great talk. And then how much does the plate motion depend on upper mantle versus lower mantle viscosity? And does the dependence change based on the time scale? Do you want me to read it again? Yes. I think I, I, you know, sure. I let's see. I yeah, I understand the question. I if you ask like uh, the plane motion is controlled by anything touched with the plane. So up mantle viscosity is more probably more important than the lower mantle. I would say, and also plane boundaries. That's why plane boundaries is so important as well. Uh, and so anything kind of you know you know touch down the you know the plane itself, right, viscosity wise, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, and then we uh, are gonna do another question from the chat. Um, the um, So a question for Harriet from Max Bezeda. Um, what seismic observables were used to estimate temperature, melt fraction, and grain size beneath Greenland, and how did you handle trade-offs? And I think Glenn should also feel free to jump in when he wants. Um, yeah, so we used a seismic tomography model 
that constrained shear wave um, velocity. And so that would give you basically the shear modulus um, at seismic time scales. So I think that was given to us at one hertz. There was a attached attenuation model. And while it wasn't a 3D attenuation model, it was a 1D attenuation model. We sort of implemented that into the workflow. And um, even though ideally we'd have a frequency dependent Q model as well, and it would be 3D. Um, but obviously that's that's very hard to constrain seismically. Um, Q is very difficult to measure. Um, and so that's what we use to constrain our model. Um, there were trade-offs for sure. And you know, I think if you have 3D Q and 3D BS, that really helps when narrowing down the trade-offs in terms of things like melt and stuff. And so if you in that study, there are kind of large posterior kind of distributions which reflect the trade-offs and the covariances. And so you can do something like, you know, decrease the grain size, and that might have the same measure as increasing the temperature on VS. And so there are plenty of trade-offs. Um, and it's interesting, the trade-offs and the intrinsic properties don't always kind of filter out into very different macroscopic me mechanical properties. Of, I'm not sure if I sort of um, explain I'm explaining that well, but you can have like massive variations in, and, and trade-offs in temperature, grain size, melt, but the viscosity that comes out of that, that could seem a little bit less, le less like a, of a mess basically. And so kind of those different processes can actually produce mechanically similar behavior. If I can just add quickly to that, that also means that from the point of view of your observations, we can't distinguish between them because they produce the same deformation. So for us, when you give us a map of viscosity, whether it comes from an estimate, a different estimate of grain size or a different estimate of temperature, it all is added to the same map. We can't tell you which one is correct because they produce the exact same GIA. Uh, Torsten? Yeah, just to quickly follow up on that, of course, this then sort of reminds us of the other constraints that we have where, say, grain size and temperature have a different effect on the density. And so if you look at things like dynamic topography, you could be able to tell those apart. And there is there is the sort of general mantle circulation aspect of things that will affect things like the background stress, for example. And Shiji mentioned that in his tests, he used a very low background stress. And so that makes nonlinear rheologies more important. If the background stress is higher, then the effect of the eyes is just not large enough. And those background stresses will in turn depend on the 3D viscosity variations in ways that complicate things, but they're also accessible through modeling leading to interesting local variations in the nonlinearity, for instance, in light of where the cratons are. And I think to add on this, I, um, Grace touched on this at the end of her talk. You know, we did say, that Lambert and I said, yeah, it is really hard to, you know, um, pick out what underlying physical intrinsic property could give rise to this single rate of GPS uplift. But, you know, Grace did kind of, emphasize getting full time series is very important. And, you know, I, I kind of flippantly said temperature and grain size have these trade-offs, but in frequency, they look very different. If you think about that time scale effect on viscosity, it looks very different. And so, you know, there are ways if, you know, if we keep keep GPS observations alive in Antarctica, that, that would help. Barbara? This brings me, uh, I've been wanting to ask this question, and you've been talking, several of you have been talking about using machine learning to help uh, accelerate the, you know, parameter space, uh, um, uh, well, study. But I'm wondering, are these processes linear enough that machine learning can really help you with this, or that you will really, uh, you know, get the right answers? because we've been talking about all these complexities and things feeding back into each other. I, um, I'll, I'll, I can start and others can jump in. It, it's a great question because, you know, there's only been two papers so far and 
those have indicated, I mean, so for example, the work we've been doing, we've been trying to emulate the difference between a 3D and a 1D model. So if you, since we're focusing on the differences, we drop, we lose some of that non-linearity and it makes, it makes it more tractable. And I think the results, the results, you know, they're not, but the problem we looked at, it gave us, um, we could simulate the 3D, full 3D model relatively well. Um, so essentially what you do is you emulate the difference and then you add your difference to just a simple 1D model output. And you can basically, I think, I can't remember the details, but you're usually within 90%. You're not, your error is not more than 10% um, for looking at sea level data, for example. So the potential's there, but it does need to be explored a lot more, and particularly in terms of putting in different ice histories and things like that, because that will then complicate things more. But you know, the potential there, and it's one way to tackle that problem. And I think it needs, you know, I think it should be explored a bit further. Yeah, and if I can just follow up on that, um, I would distinguish here different types of machine learning you can do. Glenn was talking about your joint method being a very powerful and efficient method. And I think that's very true. My current understanding of that is that it involves a certain linearization of the error structure, because you're going to look at the gradient around a certain part of your parameter space. Whereas you can also think about on the emulator, train if the training of the model gets good enough that you have very high fidelity of your emulator, then you can think about doing MCMC, which is a different approach, and then I don't think that you would lose the nonlinearity if you did that. Obviously, there is other reasons to compromise the type of parameter search. If you have to invert 3D with all of the parameter space, it's still not feasible to do MCMC, even if you're really fast, because there's way too much dimensionality. So we need to be aware of the trade-off between these different methods and be mindful of what we can simplify and not. And I think as as of now, it still comes in by trial and error. Shiji, do you want to go next? Um, sure. Yeah, I, I like to kind of make some comments here. And the way I see it is, is this problem is uh, it's complicated. Um, and also in terms of uh, the GIS studies, um, I would say maybe 95% or maybe 99% of the studies are actually uh, based on Wendy model. So the complexity, I don't, I actually think is the system is really complicated. And I don't think we actually fully understand the complexity yet. I mean, Karet talked about the, the complexity from, you know, physics point of view, right? And that's all, you know, well calculated. It's very important. I guess just from the modeling point of view, you look at the treated earth as a physical elastic, whatever system you call that. And then you apply the ice load, right? And then you kind of ask what kind of uh, response the Earth would have. And um, for three dimensional Earth, you know, we don't really know. I, I, you know that's my point of view. And I think it's a, you know, Barbara asked a question about the nonlinearity. Uh, I mean, I think it's a very important question. We don't really put any, fully understand. I I would uh, say that maybe, uh, you know, a lot of more. Uh, say numerical modeling uh, that is needed right, to really understand how the system reacts. I mean, Thorsten mentioned about how tectonical, tectonic background stress interact with a sort of much short-term stress loading. Right? Um, I don't think that actually physically that, that problem is formulated you know, very clearly, right? Because we, it's not that you simply do like add a, a stress term to this system because we're talking about the Let's say if you think about right, it's a really high frequency loading, right, versus a very gentle long term tectonic stress loading. And uh, how the two systems interact with each other, I don't really think. Actually, I don't really know if we actually really understand the system like that. Um, so I mean, I guess to do the calculation is a trivial, relatively. I guess you know we can add that tectonic background stress, whatever ten bar or ten you know ten bar or you know. Um, and you bar and there and you yeah you, you can expect the results but physically exactly what the system how the system operates I I think it's a still at least a lot of you know a lot of uh, explorations 
so I guess that's kind of my take on some of the discussions. Uh, it's just really, we really, I think from the numerical point of view, uh, or the full, considering the, the, the full scale physics, and there's just a lot of unknowns we, you know, we don't, we, you know, we, we, we're out there. Yeah, so. Okay, so we're going to go to Glenn for a quick comment. And I don't know also if Barbara wanted to say anything uh, as well, but otherwise Glenn is going to have a comment and then we will go to Steve Nurem for our wrap up. Yeah, I just want to go back to, so Grace talked about this, looking at full time series. And I just want to make the point that, you know, if, if we're looking to tease out different time variable real, real logical responses like non-Newtonian flow versus transient, you know, the only way, these could be quite subtle signals in, say, G GPS records. The only way to really tease them out accurately is to have a a, a a nice thickness history at the same location covering the same period. You have got to pull the ice model out of it if you want to really find out what the Earth is doing. And, and that's why you need these long time series. And I think it's absolutely crazy that some of these stations are being dismantled. I mean... 10, 20, 30 years is what we need to really start seeing these signals with complementary ice sat data looking at ice sheet thickness. And it, this is this is like a golden era that we're kind of just going to ignore if we start losing these GPS stations. It just doesn't make any sense. That is an excellent point to end on. Thank you to all of the panelists for your contributions. And uh, we'll do a round of applause and then we're going to go to Steve for a wrap up. Wrap up. All right. Well, this has uh, uh, been a great series of talks. I know I personally have learned a lot today and uh, I'll try to summarize uh, all these talks, which is uh, is challenging to say the least, because we covered a lot of territory here. So, uh, Rebecca Stefan got us started with an overview of GA models and observations. Uh, she discussed the various outputs of GA models and really then the different types of observations. And uh, she also discussed uh, glacially induced uh, stresses and seismicity and their importance to uh, GA science. And then we had Lambert Caron talk to us about uh, the importance of GA for uh, uh, modeling satellite gravity measurements. He talked about GRACE and GRACE follow-on and what that data tells us. Discussed how GA limits the accuracy of ice sheet mass loss estimates and also the interpretation of North American water storage signals. Uh, he discussed the challenges of how to weight uh, different observational data sets, GNSS, GRACE, sea level records, et cetera, and discussed the need for standardization within the GAA community around some of these modeling and data issues. Um, he also commented at the end that we face challenges in characterizing the errors in GA models that stem from both mantle rheology and ice history. And then we had uh, Grace Neal talk about the a discussion of using GNSS data to constrain GA models, and she focused on Antarctica. Uh, she discussed the challenges of untangling deformation signals in uh, a variety of observations, uh, but most importantly, GNSS data, uh, specifically the, uh, the long-term deformation signals from the last deglaciation versus the short-term changes from present-day ice mass changes um, due to GAA. Uh, she showed estimates of mantle viscosity estimates across Antarctica and how that affects these GAA models in Antarctica. And finally, she emphasized uh, the need to keep the GNSS networks in Antarctica and elsewhere going because long time series are needed to characterize the GA response. And then we had uh, Harriet Lau talk about disentangling different time scales of deformation, a common theme in the talks today. Uh, she talked about how the earth behaves elastically at shorter time scales, but viscoelastically at longer time scales. And further talked about how that aspect of it might impact uh, future ice sheet mass loss. Um, then she also talked about the connection of all this to rock physics and the the, the how we're estimating viscoelastic models from rock samples. Uh, she showed an improved viscoelastic model from Greenland uh, related to these ideas. And 
uh, ended up with a, a comment about how the, the importance of understanding how rocks to form on multiple time scales. And then we had Shi Ji Zong talk about the, the, the challenges of understanding observations of processes on different time scales, um, the due to, and also how we uh, interpret those observations with uneven spatial and temporal distribution and uh, untangling all that from uh, uh, ice sheet model errors. Um, she also talked about the time dependent viscosity due to stress dependence, which depends on the ice load as well as the rate of ice sheet mass loss. And he also discussed how GAA can modulate uh, plate tectonic processes. And Shiji finished up with a uh, discussion of new open source code for modeling GAA that includes the effects of 3D mantle and this is their structure. And then finally, Glenn Milne uh, wrapped up the day for us by discussing uh, paths for the development of better ice loading models, um, showed how there's still ice missing in the models when compared to sea level records, um, discussed how ice models are, are, are wrong uh, sometimes because they've depended on a 1D earth model and they need to move to 3D models and be coupled together. Uh, he discussed the need for longer term, more longer term sea level records. Uh, he also commented that uh, past four might include using a joint methods and machine learning methods. Uh, and ultimately, uh, Glenn commented that uh, GA studies not only provide constraints on Earth rheology, which is what we talked a lot about today, but also provide insights into future changes in land ice and the evolution of sea level. So that's kind of a little summary of what we discussed today. I want to thank the uh, the speakers. They put a lot of effort in these talks and it showed. Uh, I'd also like to thank everybody that joined online. Uh, hope you all got something out of our workshop today. And with that, we'll conclude. Thank you.